Welcome to the Agency Founder Podcast. Are you ready to grow your marketing agency? We pull back the curtain to show you how real marketing agency founders struggled, built, and scaled their agencies. Practical advice, lessons learned, wins, and losses. We hold nothing back. Now your host, Jeremy Sonny. Welcome to the Agency Founder Podcast by Moonshine Marketing. Every single week, we interview successful founders of marketing agencies at different points in their journey to pass on their victories, defeats, challenges, and lessons learned to help you take your agency to new heights. This week, we're speaking with Joshua Chin of Kronos Agency, an e-commerce email marketing agency. Joshua, thanks so much for being here. Thanks for having me, Jeremy. Appreciate it. So tell me about Kronos Agency, obviously an email, e-commerce email marketing agency, but tell me a little bit more about that. Yeah, absolutely. So we partner up with high growth e-commerce brands that are typically around uh, making about a, a million dollars in revenue and above. Uh, the sweet spot is between one mil and 50 mil in annual revenue, high, fast growth e-com brands. And we take their email marketing program basically to the next level, adding an additional layer of profits, turning email into a super profitable channel that drives growth. Uh, instead of it being just you know a, a random communication channel that most brands would see it as, and um, we have been doing this for about three years now, and it's it's been great. That's wonderful, yeah. So three years in your agency, I assume, has been growing well during that time. About how many how many folks are there at Kronos? Yeah, there are, um, I believe, sixty seven, sixty eight of us right now. Wow, that's quite the growth in three years. Yeah, it, it's been a, it, it's been it's been it's been crazy to say the least. Um, and I, I started this out off my dorm room back in university in Singapore, and it's uh, yeah, it, it really grew grew beyond what I imagined it to 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 be initially. And I, we just continued to set new heights, new goals, and we just kept kind of pushing towards those <laughs> those new goals and. Uh, it's been it's been great. The whole team is uh, remote. We do have an office in in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, just as a as a, as a little experiment at at the start, just to see how it's like to build a, an office team. We have a really small team of eleven uh, in in Malaysia, and it's been fun. But I enjoy the hybrid approach to to working while having a HQ of sorts. We still enjoy the the idea of having the flexibility to work from basically wherever we want to work from. Yeah, that's incredible. That's really cool that you've been able to kind of strike that balance and, and do a little bit of both while having a lot of flexibility. I actually that, you know, what you said makes me want to take a step back. And how, how did you personally kind of get into marketing? And, you know, tell me about that, like kind of in the run up to, you know, before you started your agency and all of that. Oh, sure. Yeah. So dorm room. <laughs> this this is an interesting story. Um it was, uh, I believe, October of 2017, and at, at a point in time, I was, I was basically near my breaking point. My business was brand new, and I landed my sixth client in just two short months. But the problem was, I'm also a full-time university student in Singapore with a full-time internship. So I was waking up at 5 a.m., working till 11 p.m., just trying to keep up with it all. And I was working really hard primarily to give my, myself, my, my, my family, my dad, my mom, and my sister uh, a better life. So a, as a kid, I grew up in Jobar, Malaysia, a little town just over the border of Singapore. And when I was 10 years old, my parents declared bankruptcy and they divorced. Before the divorce, my, my, my life was simple, it was peaceful, <laughs> and in my mind it was perfect. Uh, and after school, my sister and I would play in, in a toy store surrounding my parents' fruit shop. At the, at the mall, they were wholesale, wholesalers of fruit. The bankruptcy and divorce basically left my family kind of fractured. It also forced an excruciating choice on, on me. I had to choose between staying with my mom or, or my dad. And as, as a kid, that was incredibly difficult. I was staying, my, staying with my dad at a point in time, so I chose to stay with him. Making a choice like that broke my heart and <laughs> probably my, my mom's too. Uh, it gave me a deep sense of the fragility of relationships and at the same time, the sanctuary that it, it gives. So I, I decided that I would do whatever it takes to provide a, a, a good financial security for my family. And I would do whatever it takes to see, steep my life in, in meaningful relationships. 
Next, I went to university in Singapore. I did a lot of side hustles. I did a bunch of stuff just to make money and get past the day. But I like the idea of um, you know making money and making an impact. But I didn't like the fact that it was strictly transactional. Things like drop shipping on eBay, tutoring, and and waitering. It was uh, there was no opportunity to develop any relationships with uh, with my clients or people in general. At least I didn't have that experience. So determined to find a line of work that I loved, I took basically all the penny of the little savings that I had. I reinvested them into online courses and books about various online businesses. And that's when I found a course on e-commerce email marketing. I loved it immediately. Like eBay, it had the immediacy of selling, you know, of, of drop shipping. But I could also build relationships with my clients. And I was able to build relas- relationships with our clients' customers in a, in a very meaningful manner that is, you know, not just in for the short term. Uh, so working out of my dorm room, I dove into learning everything I could about it. And within a month, I convinced a few strangers that I met online to let me work on their email marketing for, for free. Soon after, I gained two paying clients. And then the miracle happened. My first ever paying client referred me to a, you know, superstars in the Singapore e-commerce scene. Um, and, and they liked the work that I, I did. So soon after I was sitting across a large desk from them, my palms were sweaty, I have a lump in my throat and I was you know, just, just dying from imposter syndrome. But they became my first major client and they referred me to basically even more clients in their immediate network and people that they knew. My confidence grew. That was how I got my first six really meaningful, substantial clients while being a full-time student and with a full-time internship. And that's how I ended up stretched to my limits. So something had to give. I I needed more sleep and I needed a business partner. I knew I didn't want anyone just anyone suited for the position. I I needed to be surrounded by friends and meaningful relationships that I that I trusted. So I called up my child friend uh, Louis and I recruited him to be my COO. And uh, together, without any experience in, in building a business or, or marketing, we hired our first employee in the same month. And we basically kept applying all our profits in growing our team and our knowledge and our experience. And that's basically my, my single obsession for the second half of my university life. And by the time we graduated, we were a team of uh, 30 people remote with an additional office in KL in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. Yeah, that's incredible. It's a really amazing story. That's got to be an interesting mix of like your day to day when you're, you know, part of the day you're a student, part of the day you're leading a team of 30, which is really huge, right? Um, can you tell me about that? Like what, what it was like to, you know, kind of switch in between being a student, being a founder, running like the business of that size and everything? Yeah, Jeremy, you know, you know what, it's, it's actually, uh, you know, most people think, uh, Josh, just quit. Why, 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 would, why wouldn't you just quit school? <laughs> it's, it's both a practical reason and, and also a, a some degree of, uh, of, of, of fear, but it worked out fine uh, in, in the end. Firstly, I was holding a scholarship, which meant that I, if, if I broke the, the contract, uh, it would mean a large penalty that I probably cannot afford at that point in time, especially since I was, we were basically pouring back all our profits back into the business and growing the team. And on, on, the, on the flip side, I, I just wanted to continue building the network that I, was, that I had and the experience that I was having in, in school, but with a completely different set of contacts. Now that I was building a business that was you know, profitable and growing, it gave me a deep sense of, of meaning behind what I was learning in school. And I was in business school in, uh, in the National University of Singapore. So that, get, that gave me a lot, of, a lot more motivation and in, in understanding and pursuing the subjects that I genuinely had interest in instead of what could make me money by being employed in a massive investment bank further down the road. So what ended up happening was I spent about 20 
odd hours per week on school, both on classes and schoolwork and all that stuff. I skipped all the non-essential <laughs> lectures and classes that I could skip. I kind of, you know, I, I took notes from friends. I pre-recorded lectures and basically re-watched them on 2x the, the speed <laughs> or 3x even sometimes if the lecture was really slow. And for the basically remaining hours of my time, I, I was basically just spending it on the business, finding new clients, learning about new aspects of growing the business, meeting new people. Yeah, it was primarily agency Kronos, Kronos first, then school second. <laughs> and yeah, that, that worked out fine. And I was living in a dorm. So that gave me kind of the super hyper-focused, uh, environment that I, I really didn't have anything else to do. I, I had the choice to not basically, uh, uh, you know, embark on, on social gatherings and social activities. That, that was my compromise. And I, I was 100% okay with, with, with that. And having my family away from me, you know, it's, it's not great. They're still in Malaysia. I'm, I'm still based out of Singapore. But being apart gave me a lot of space to myself to really work on the things that I, I really needed to work on to make things work. That's really incredible, you know, and it's kind of, uh, it, I think it speaks a lot to like your character that you were able to take that and like turn that experience of being in a dorm, being in university and all that, and like turn it into like this advantage for actually growing, you know, your agency where a lot of people, you know, might get distracted with like, you know, kind of social gatherings and, and things like that. You know, you, you were able to kind of turn it into this like hyper-focused time. Do you have like, any sort of like tips for, you know, people that might be like lacking focus or are trying to like figure out how to best kind of make use of their time uh, in order to like focus on growing their agency while like balancing the other like, you know, necessities of life and, and obligations and things like that. Since it seems like that's, you know, your superpower <laughs> is the ability to balance and focus that way. Oh, trust me, there, there was no balance. <laughs> there, 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 <laughs> there's definitely no balance. I was in a long-term relationship, you know, at that point in time. No, I mean, we're still, we're still together, but, uh, you know, at that point in time, it, it got so unbalanced in, in, uh, in what I was prioritizing in my life that my girlfriend felt so neglected that she basically broke down one day. <laughs> so that was when I knew, okay, I've, I probably pushed the, the, the envelope a little bit too far here. But I, I believe that I believe in the, in this analogy that that a mentor kind of gave me. Uh, life is like four stoves, and you have a limited amount of of gas that you can use to kind of turn the stove up on on high at any point in time. So the the four stoves were health, uh, family, business, and social, or basically fun, and you can only have two on high at any point in time and, and the other two will be on, on low or, or zero basically and if you have all four of them on low you're basically accomplishing nothing you're cooking nothing so at that point in time I, I had family on, on low I had social on low I had my health on medium and business on super high so that, that was kind of how I kind of uh, thought about things and I thought about it, not, not in terms of how it's so unbalanced in, in a single time frame, but instead in, in seasons. I, I knew that at, at that point in time, I, I needed to get things working to get things off the ground. I needed to basically put business on high and everything else on low. And I have to be okay with that. Because once there's a, you know, some progress and growth in, in my business, I can then kind of ease off on that as per what I'm doing right now and kind of turn up the gas on, on family, health, and, and, and social. But even today, social is on, on super low. I'm moderately high on, on family and high on, on health and moderately high on, on business. And that's kind of how I thought about things. And just being aware of that gives you the sense of control that you're doing it intentionally and life is not happening to you. Now that I'm taking things back into control, that, that was a really helpful analogy to me. 
Yeah, no, that's a really good analogy. I, I like hearing that. You know, I think that um, something I know that I've struggled with in the past is trying to go high, super high on all of the different burners at the same time. And, and it, it fails pretty spectacularly um, when you don't have that. But it, it's good to hear that, you know, you talk about like the intentionality and like the thing of like, you know, it's not something that happens to you. It's something that you can affect. And while obviously, you know, there's lots of things outside of your control, you can always choose how you react to situations, how you adapt and things like that. Could you tell me like a little bit more about like how how you utilize that like day to day? Because I think it's like something that's a very common trait I see among successful entrepreneurs is understanding Yes, maybe I can't control the outcome of every single thing, but I can always choose how I react and, you know, just they focus on their own process and their own ability to affect change and their own abilities like that. So I would love to hear kind of your perspective on that. Yeah, absolutely. I I have a few points to add to that. Number one, it's it's kind of a, a culture that, that I've I've been able to build with my co-founder in, in, in our company focus on the things that we can control the things that are outside of our control are completely irrelevant and if you're being bothered or affected by it it's it's no one's fault but yours but at, at the same time it's it's super important to have a sense of control to some degree in in, in our basically on, on a daily basis without that sense of control that sense of self and knowing that i am in control of myself i tend to go basically haywire and I know that my, my emotions and, and how I make decisions are going to be really, really bad. So what I've done is I anchored myself to things in my life that I have absolute 100% control over and knowing that if I've, I'm able to achieve or complete those things that I have absolute control over, I'm good to go. Things like my diet, choices like going to the gym and you don't have to be alone you can always find an accountability partner which i i've always had uh in, in working out today I'm, I'm much more fortunate to be able to afford a, a personal trainer that keeps me accountable to basically everything that i do in, in the gym but you know prior to that i was just working with friends and that worked out just as well uh with my diet knowing what i what i eat and uh, right now i'm i'm, I'm on a, a keto diet and um just keeping track of everything that I eat and how I feel, knowing that all of these decisions that I make are 100% in my control gives me a sense of confidence that just cannot be replaced by anything else in my life. Even, you know, even making a, a million dollars a month or a million, a million bucks a year, it, it doesn't compare to having that sense of internal control and confidence. And I, I firmly believe that all of that comes from within and the decisions that that you make on a daily basis it's a small little things i i've actually heard this from i believe it was an interview with the, the rock dwayne johnson he said that at his lowest point he remained resilient obviously i'm par paraphrasing here but he remained resilient and confident knowing that he'll get through this because he knew that no matter what happened he had his two hands to to work to, to go to the gym uh, and continue working out and put in the hard work and sweat. And that was, yeah, that was kind of the principle that I bought into. I love that. And I hear it from a lot of like very high performing people too. You know, there's um, a, uh, he was a U.S. Navy SEAL and then he became an admiral in the U.S. Navy. And he talks about how every single day you should wake up and make your bed. And he said, because then you'll have accomplished the first task of the day you'll like know that you can handle anything from there. It's like this sense of control, like you pretty much always can get up and make your bed. And so that's how he starts off his day every day and like makes it very crisp and clean, like, you know, like the way that they taught him to. And it's a really interesting speech. Um, but yeah, it's this, this, this common sort of attitude that I hear um, between like, you know, high performing people, whether they're entrepreneurs or athletes or, or what have you, um, is, is this focus on what they can control and just doing it really, really well. Kind of shifting gears a little bit. I, I love hearing about this mindset, you know, but looking back, kind of getting started with your agency, is there anything that you would say that you would like repeat and you would like wish you would have done sooner? And then alternatively, 
do, are there also things that, you know, you wish that you wouldn't have done or you would do a little bit differently with like the perspective that you have now? I'm just curious about that, like kind of like some lessons learned, I suppose, both good and bad that we you could share with the listeners. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I, I, I'm not sure if this is unique to me, but I, I'm a super risk averse person just in, in general. I, I hate taking risks that I have no control over. And it's weird. It seems like an antithesis to, to being an entrepreneur. But I, I've, I mean, I've, I've come to realize that actually a lot of entrepreneurs are also pre-risk risk averse. But yeah, anyways, because of that, I've been really conservative with a lot of the decisions that, that I've been, uh, you know, that, that I made in the, in the past. And a lot of it comes down to, you know, the speed of how quickly I make decisions that were important and, you know, not wanting to take that leap and kind of finding that balance between being too aggressive in making a choice without enough information versus being paralyzed by too much analysis. And it's really difficult to, you know, it's, it's easy to read about it and, and to know to kind of to fire first and then you get ready and you aim again and you fire. And, but it's, it's not as easy as one might think, especially if you're in the field and you're actually faced with a really difficult decision. Like, should I make this super expensive hire when I don't know if my agency is going to be, you know, meeting its, its goals in the next month? Should I hire first and worry about sales or should I sell something that I didn't have in capacity first and then worry about hiring later? These are things that we kind of, from an outsider's point of view, like on hindsight, it's super easy to see, but in the field at that point in time, it's, you're, you're obviously blindsided by just so many things. So what I've come to realize at, at the end of the day is that it, it has nothing to do with making decisions or being risk averse or, or, or risk taking. It has to do with getting enough information and I found the best way to, to get the right amount of information is to rely on communities of, of entrepreneurs and agency founders. And my, I guess my biggest regret is not being able to find that tribe earlier than I did. I mean, I'm pretty lucky already to have you know, found mentors and friends and people and peers who are willing to share and generous enough to you know, impart their knowledge to me. But had I found some of these folks a little bit earlier and had these conversations a little bit earlier, I would be so much better off today than, uh, than, than what we are, uh, we are currently. So yeah, I, I guess if, if there are any regrets, it would be, you know, not making that leap to reach out and to research on people who might have been there, done that. Yeah. I mean, you know, selfishly, that's why I started the podcast, right? So I could learn from a lot of people smarter than me, <laughs> um, you know, get their perspective, learn from them, like, you know, create like relationships, right? Like through getting to know the people that I have on my show. I think it's absolutely critical. I think it's like almost a cliche at this point. But like, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together, right? <laughs> sort of thing. You can make lots of very quick decisions on your own, but are they necessarily the right decisions? You know, having that kind of perspective from others is, is, is incredibly valuable. No, that's amazing. I loved, um, I, I loved hearing that. And I, I love kind of your general perspective as well. You know, if you had any sort of advice that, you know, you, you want to do in part or, you know, any sort of like last thought here, for people that are maybe, you know, thinking about building an agency or are, you know, have started the process and are, you know, trying to find their like niche or like, you know, they're trying to find that like growth uh, inflection point. What would you say to them right now? Like in, in early agency founders days? Yeah, absolutely. Know, know what you're getting yourself into, not from the perspective of what the upsides are, but rather what the struggles might be. I found that, you know, no matter what business you're going to be, you're embarking on, there's bound to be lots of upsides that that's going to be super enticing. And that's probably, probably the reason why you're in the business in the first place. Being an agency founder, we are probably in, in the agency world because it's, 
you know, it's easy to get started. It's, it's, uh, it's relatively easy to, to grow and it's, it's also highly profitable and it's relatively lower in, in risk. But that, that's, that doesn't matter as much as what the struggles are going to be because that's what, what's going to stop you. The upsides are not going to keep you going as much as what the struggles are going to hold you back on doing. At least that's what, I, what I've come to realize. And coming to terms with the struggles, like managing a massive team without much experience and having to face all kinds of clients that may not be the nicest, may be toxic to your team, and knowing how to deal with that are sometimes things that we don't want to be doing as a business owner but are inherently the struggles that come with the business model of growing an agency. Obviously, there are ways of going around it, circumventing them, but fundamentally knowing what they are and whether or not you can accept them will be the kind of the, the, the cornerstone to not, not just success, but just sustainability in the business in, in general. So yeah, For me, I've come to terms with the struggles that I have to face, and they're mostly people problems. And my entire calendar is pretty much filled with with me things, mostly internal. And I know where we're going to be, and I know where we got to go. And this is the process that we have to take and the struggles that we have to face. No, I I love that. I think that, you know, it's too easy to get blinded by the rose colored glasses, right? You just see only good things in the future and not acknowledging the struggles that come with it and, you know, kind of planning around the struggles, understanding them and how to deal with them, I think is incredibly important and, you know, arguably more important than the, uh, than, you know, focusing on kind of the upside, you know, the, the dream vision, right? Is just be realistic, be grounded. Um, no, I love hearing it. Well, Joshua, thank you so much for coming on the show. Really appreciate your time. You know, we always give uh, our guests, you know, quick, like 30 seconds, one minute to pitch whatever you want, um, whether it's your agency or anything else. So I will go ahead and give you that time now. Yeah, thank you. So, you know, if, if there are any e-commerce brands out there wanting some help, with email marketing, taking things to the next level, turning email into a super profitable channel that's generating 20 to 30% of your total revenue. With email alone, the best way to contact us is sales at chronos.agency. And if, if there are any agency founders who might want to connect with me, I'm always available on, on LinkedIn, Facebook, um, or email. Email would be joshua at chronos.agency. Happy to have a chat. You know, to share some ideas and, and basically share what we, what what I've learned and learned from what you have learned in in your journey. Happy to do so. Joshua, thank you so much for being on the show again. You know, this is a really jam-packed, value-filled episode. You know, I know that I learned a ton from Joshua and his approach on the things that you can control and the things you can't. You know, take these lessons, apply them to building your agency, and good luck out there, everybody. Happy marketing. <laughs>